Hi, I'm Max Kaiser. This is the Kaiser Report. Hey, that dirtbag Tim Geithner's making the rounds again. Stacy, tell me more. Max, there's the central banks and the governments, and they're there to help you. Geithner backs Merkel's crisis plan. Now, this was obviously this week's uh, summit, yet another summit to save the Eurozone. But this quote from Geithner is what really intrigued me here, Max. Financial crises are ultimately resolved when governments and central banks succeed in creating conditions that make it compelling for investors to take the risk involved in lending to governments and to banks. Yeah, they still operate under this myth that they need to incentivize these so-called investors to take so-called risk. This gives the impression that there are individuals or institutions out there with capital and they're just waiting to get a good deal to invest that capital. So Geithner is not being truthful because if he was, he would indicate that there are no solvent investors or banks in the world today. Their only possible action is to endogenously, to use a Steve Kane word, loan out fresh fiat debt-based silly putty confetti that some call money as a way to perpetuate their own aggrandizement and bonus pools. <laughs> there are no investors. Furthermore, he also uses the word risk, which is misplaced because we know that if these so-called investors were ever to lose any of their potential bonus pool money, they simply put a gun to the head of these governments and shake them down for more confetti. Every single word he utters is completely wrong. But there's also two sorts of investors. They're the ones he's talking about, the ones that can never lose, and they're the ones that only lose. The house always wins. You invest with any bank, and your money is basically there to be hijacked. Well, these aren't the investors you're referring to. You're referring to the victims <laughs> who are being asked to suffer through austerity measures, through economic repression by having their capital and savings stolen in the form of redirection vis-a-vis zero -vis percent interest rates. So they're subsidizing Geithner's crony speculator terrorists. But he also mentions that financial crises are ultimately resolved when governments and central banks act. So this takes me to this next headline, Max. Sprott frustrated with hostage-taking paper silver market. Now, there's the silver market issue here, but this quote in particular is what he's referring to the central banks and governments taking action. Over the long term, Sprott believes that the market has made gold the reserve currency. He says, I don't care whether the central banks have or governments have, but the market's made it the reserve currency. Central banks have been aiding and abetting that process. They're almost making it the reserve currency by their actions, not by their statements. And when it was a reserve currency, silver traded at a ratio of 15 to 16 to 1 of the price of gold. Eric Sprott up there in Canada, billionaire, and also our friend down in Mexico. Hugo Salinas Price. Yeah, who's trying to bring silver back into the Mexican economy as a hard currency. Those two guys can squeeze the U.S. from the north and the south, and they can squeeze the U.S. and the fiat money shysters and the Goldman Sachs of the world to death. And Sprott is the vigilante, the gold and silver vigilante, with the firepower to do it. And I beseech him to pull the pin on this fiat money grenade. Now, when he says that we're going to a de facto hard money currency standard, gold standard anyway, he's also referring to the fact that, for example, the very, very, very crooked and industrial strength mafiosos at the CME in Chicago keep raising margin requirements. Mm. So people end up paying more 100% cash for their precious metal positions. People, for example, at MF Global, who had their margin accounts ransacked by the folks at JP Morgan, which we now know they stole the money to offset a short silver position. They're going to 100% gold and physical, gold and gold physical, 100% paid for cash, no margin. So you're becoming a de facto gold and silver standard. So they're doing the hard lifting for us. And they'll be forced out, out of their windows, and they'll do the flying broker routine soon enough.
Now, one of the arguments always against holding gold or silver by the likes of Warren Buffett is that it pays, it offers no return. Japan's gold for bonds offer could boost return by 5.9 times. Japanese Finance Minister Jun Azumi will be rewarding investors who buy reconstruction bonds with half an ounce of gold, an added incentive that could boost the return by nearly six times. So if you had just bought the bonds on offer, you would receive approximately 15,000 yen back in interest. However, with this half an ounce gold offer, you receive back 89,000 yen. Well, that's exactly right. So as more sovereigns begin to tie their bond markets to precious metals, of course, that will trigger, under game theory, a mad scramble for other countries to do the same. I predict that a country in 2012 will offer a gold-backed currency outright. Like Eric Spraw argued, Max, this is being forced upon the central banks and the governments by their very own actions. Because in this case, Japan has the largest government debt in the world. So obviously they've reached an end point in that that they have to incentivize people with actual physical real wealth. The Japanese bond investor has been the most legendary in the world. They have helped sustain the largest government debt to GDP in the world. Yeah, and Japan has very little gold bullion. They don't have uh, hardly any gold. So where are they going to get this gold from? They're going to have to go into the open market and buy the gold right now, which is another big sovereign out there buying gold in the open market. But talking about so much paper in the world, so much fiat currency, so much bond paper in the world, that in order to get suckers into the game, you've got to give them something real back. Guess which country has debt? of nearly 1,000% of GDP. Now, most people assume it's Japan, Max, but if you check out this chart from Morgan Stanley, lo and behold, number one is the UK. And the reason why? Banking debt that's four times the size of the GDP of the UK. That's right. The banking debt in the UK is four times GDP. So we're talking five or six trillion pounds of bank debt in the UK, on top of the other trillions of debt that the country has anyway, sovereign debt. Now, going forward, they have very little gold. They sold half the gold under Gordon Brown, so there's no help there. And uh, second of all, they'll say that this debt is, of course, balanced in the global debt markets. There are counterparties that are investing back and forth and that there's very little risk. Tell that to the investors at MF Global. When the counterparties just simply stole the money, when John Corzine reached in and stole a few billion dollars, uh, there's no counterparties that can help you there. They're going to get none of their money. So if you think these banks in the UK are not exposed to four times UK's GDP with absolutely toxic, worthless debt, <laughs> you've got a big pile of Marmite enema coming your way. You mentioned MF Global, and that's in this headline here, Max. Kiss the MF Global money goodbye, sources say. So MF Global customers are at the moment expecting to recover about 65% of their funds. That's it, okay? But the article then goes on to say, one thing seems to be certain. Investigators and banks that have had extensive dealings with MF Global believe whatever money is missing is probably gone forever and won't be able to be returned to investors when the investigation is complete. That's because even if customer funds are located, if they were used to pay off legitimate claims of creditors, those creditors are legally entitled to the money. Max, who's the biggest creditor? JP Morgan. <laughs> and JP Morgan is the central bank that Timothy Geithner said is there to save the system. So they're there to save the system by destroying the system. Sounds like America's approach in Vietnam. Now, of course, this is also the other thing that puts lie to the whole argument that Timothy Geithner says is that if it's governments and central banks that will restore your trust in the system, but they're doing nothing that would suggest that they're anywhere near close to that because what you need is the criminals in jail. Because why would you go into the system where you, you might not get your cash deposit back? In this case, what happens next time the likes of Northern Rock goes bust and they had loads of legitimate creditors. What if they just took your deposits and said, we're legitimate legal creditors. Sorry, you had your money in the bank. Oh, the, anyone who own, owns a GLD, 
the exchange traded fund for gold, or SLV, the exchange traded fund for silver, the, the backers, JP Morgan and HSBC, are going to say the exact same thing. When you go to get your metal, they'll say, well, we're the creditor. The banks, HSBC and JP Morgan, are bankrupt now, but uh, their creditors are taking your precious metal in collateral, and you'll get a receipt for some cash. And by the way, your cash is now worth 10 cents on the dollar. So if you have money in those GLD or SLV, you don't have anything. You've got a pile of nothing. You should get out immediately and buy real physical metal. But they understand, these central banks and the governments understand why people don't want to go into the markets, and that's because they're likely to be defrauded. So here is Obama on the campaign trail earlier this week, and he said, Obama seeks stronger penalties for Wall Street fraud. Too often, he said, we've seen Wall Street firms violating major anti-fraud laws because the penalties are too weak, and there's no price for being a repeat offender. No more. I'll be calling for a legislation that makes those penalties count so that firms don't see punishment for breaking the law as just the price of doing business. So they want to increase the penalties from like five bucks to 10. Yeah, something you heard on the 17th grade of some golf course somewhere before heading to the clubhouse and, you know, picking up uh, some bribe money from some lobbyist from the banking industry to pay for his reelection. The guy's words are not worth the toilet paper. Well, the article points out, I mean, this is how ridiculous the situation is. People think it's over-exaggeration, but listen to this. Penalties at the moment are limited to the amount of profits made from the corporate misconduct. You know, what if all the looters in London had just had to pay back the profits from their looting misconduct? They're so clueless, and it's so beautiful because they're heading to the gallows. It's going to be fun. They're so, I mean, listen to the words these people are saying. They're so clueless. They're so out of touch. They don't understand the fire that they're playing with. And the show about to explode on the world seat is going to be entertaining. Stacey Herbert, thanks so much for being on the Kaiser Report. Thank you, Max. Don't go away. Much more coming away. So stay right there. Hi, I'm Max Kaiser. Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. Time now to go to Sydney, Australia, and talk to Das. This financial commentator is so famous, he just goes by that, Das. Das, welcome to the Kaiser Report. Good to be with you, Max. All right, Das, let's talk about Europe. You've just written a piece published on Dow Jones Market Watch entitled, What Happens in Europe Won't Stay in Europe. Tell us about it. The basic thing is, in the United States, there is a feeling that what's going to happen in Europe isn't going to affect them. And I think that's delusionary. And there's a few channels of contagion that I think are worth noting. The first is between Europe and America, they're about 40% of global uh, the economy, 25% of trade, and they're each other's largest partners in terms of trading. So whatever happens in Europe will affect American exports. And they export about 400 billion a year which is roughly about 20% of their exports. The other thing is the United States sends stuff to Asia, like you know, little Microsoft programs and sort of Intel chips and all that sort of stuff, which gets built into products which goes to Europe. And obviously, we all know Europe is not going to grow. And at best, you know, they're going to flatline and have maybe low growth. But worst case, they fall off the edge of a cliff. That's going to affect both the United States and it's going to affect China. So basically, that's the first line of contagion in the United States. The second line of contagion is the very predictable one of the financial markets. U.S. banks, according to a congressional report, have $641 billion of exposure to Europe. That's not all to the governments. That's to companies as well. Now, they say they have hedges. We don't know what they have. But let's assume they hedge to some degree. But it's still a pretty big number. Then, of course, there are the lovely savings of American retirees some part of that has found its way into Europe as well. So they've got substantial exposures to Europe. And to some extent, I think Barack Obama and the Democrat administration in the White House spends a lot of time worrying about what's going to happen to Europe because it's going to affect what happens in the United States. And the other thing is all this lovely chatter in Europe about let's devalue by printing money and all that sort of stuff, that's also going to have an effect on the United States because it's going to force up basically the US dollar. And the export sector in the United States has been doing quite well. It's grown by 11% year on year. And that's going to get affected if the dollar value. So there's all these sort of contagions going on. All right, let's uh, take a look at this. So I wanted to ask you if you've taken a look at the United Kingdom at all, because of all the countries in the world, they are actually in the deepest debt of all. Their uh, banks 
uh, are uh, carrying four to five times the country's GDP in unsecured debts, uh, as on top of the notional value of the sovereign debts, uh, as well as uh, some other contingent debts. They're really the most indebted country in the world. And the UK has taken an adversarial position against Europe uh, as because Europe wants to rewrite their constitution. Uh, Sarkozy and Merkel to try to accommodate uh, their reconstruction and re-securitization uh, of all this bad debt. And David Cameron in the UK is saying, wait a minute, you can't do that. So w do you see a co this conflict escalating between the UK and continental Europe? You've got two questions there, so let me answer each in part. One is the very high level of borrowing by financial institutions. And you're absolutely correct, the UK is one. Switzerland also, interestingly enough, is the other one. And the argument in defense of that is these are entrepot banking centers. So they borrow money in, then they lend it out on the other side. So you can't really look at the financial system balance sheets. But the problem, of course, is banks are highly levered. And it doesn't really matter where the money's coming from and where it's going. If the people who actually have taken out the loans don't pay you back, it doesn't really matter whether you're an entrepot center or you're an entrepreneurial center or you're a bankrupt center because that's what you're going to be because you're going to be bankrupt. And that's what we found with basically the problems of banks like RBS and Lloyds in the United Kingdom. So you're absolutely correct. It's the banking sector in that sense, which basically acts as this conduit and creates problems. But the second question that you ask is an even more fascinating one, because there is this sort of pas de deux that's taking place between the banks and the sovereigns. Because the banks have problems because under the Basel rules, which is the banking regulations, sovereigns were treated in a very interesting way. Sovereign debt was regarded as being, wait for it, risk-free. So if you were an OECD country, which a country like Greece is, your bonds were risk-free. So the banks loaded up on this debt on the balance sheet, which is, of course, now toxic. And if they were to mark to market that debt properly, in other words, take the write-offs, because we all know this debt's not going to be paid back in full. So under those circumstances, the banks would have solvency issues. So basically, they need to get rid of this, this sovereign debt off their balance sheet, except, of course, they can't because they need capital to do it and they don't have the capital. So the other part of this fascinating equation at the moment is the sovereigns can't issue debt. And in part, they need the debt, curiously enough, not only to roll over their borrowings, but to inject money into the banks to recapitalize them to perversely be able to write off the debt which they issued in the first place. So there's a strange circularity that's going around here. And at the moment, because countries like Italy and Spain are having trouble issuing debt, they're leaning very heavily on the banking system, saying, buy my debt, buy my debt. But this just makes the problem worse. And the real issue, I think, in this relationship goes back to a fundamental discussion that you and I have touched on previously which is once you get very large financial institutions in these countries and they dominate the economy in various ways, this sort of relationship between the sovereign and the bank, it's very deeply embedded and it's very, very hard to unwind in any meaningful shape. And it's now a serious barrier to resolving the European debt woes. I'll explain that quite simply because the simplest way to do it, we all know, is these countries have to reduce the quantum of debt, which means Greece has to write off its debt by, say, 60%. And Italy might not need 60%, but 20 or 30% certainly would go a long way of writing down their stock of debt. But the problem is you can't do that because the moment you do that, Italian banks and other European banks which hold us debt suffer massive losses. And basically, then you have the insolvency issue of the banks and the sovereign has to step in anyway, which makes the problem worse. And this relationship, this very toxic relationship, is very dangerous. And I think that lies at the heart of trying to resolve this European debt crisis. All right, Das, you talk about the circularity uh, that's going on here. Sovereigns bailing each other out and borrowing from each other to bail each other out. In the broader context, going, looking at this over a 30-year period, let's say, when interest rates in the world, particularly uh, as set by the Federal Reserve in the United States, hits 15 or 16 percent, this was the beginning of a 30-year bull market in bonds, which is to say that interest rates over 30 years have been trending lower. And this circularity was able to continue because there was always a higher bond price to raise the collateral and bail you out. But starting in the last few years, with interest rates at zero, there's no place to go to keep the circularity, or as some might call it, the Ponzi scheme going.
So central banks are engaging in things like quantitative easing, which are an attempt to force interest rates below zero, but there are limitations to that, especially when you're taking it out of the hide of the general population who's now in open revolt. So uh, we're at that inflection point now. Interest rates are at zero. You can't extend and pretend. The Ponzi scheme is finished. So in its social revolt around the world, do policymakers understand that they've inflamed a global revolution in this way? Well, I think this is the thing that they don't get because I think the key here is that they think they're all powerful. And to some extent, the last 30 years have sort of deluded themselves into thinking that. Because remember, we're talking about a period of history which really goes back a long way, as you say, but probably goes back to the post-war era, where firstly, you know, you did a bit of fiddling on the budgets, you did a bit of fiddling on monetary policy, and somehow mysteriously, you know, you could seem to be able to control the economy. And obviously, once Mr. Greenspan got to power in the Federal Reserve in the United States, he sort of appeared to be, as you remember, his nickname was the maestro. He could sort of manipulate the economy. So they don't actually get the fact that they only have very few policy tools. Number one, the budget. Well, the budget, unless you can borrow and spend, and now they can't borrow, they've got a problem. And the other is, as you correctly point out, monetary policy, and once rates go to zero, I mean, basically all quantitative easing to me is because you can't change the price, you change the volume. That's basically all it is. And you're absolutely correct. They're running out of runway now. And this is the fascinating thing about Europe, because I hear constantly now from people, look, it's all very simple. If the ECP could just print money, everything would be absolutely, totally fine. And I keep saying, well, hang on, let's back up a stage here. The first thing is, if the ECB could print money, does that change the stock of debt in any of these beleaguered economy? And the answer is no. The second, how does it help the banks which are holding this debt? Simply because this, we know this debt can't be paid. And at some point in time, these leverage institutions are going to have to take a write-off. And they're not capable of doing that. Third, how does it help these economies grow? Because we all know we need a bit of growth to get out of this. And finally, how does it actually not, exactly as you say, debase the trust that we need to have in the monetary system, in the value of the euro notes or the dollar notes you have? So all that breaks apart. But even more important than that, because you've got these very low levels of interest rates, which zero, I suppose, is the lowest you can go, and I bet you anything, Max, the one thing the ECB is going to do in the next couple of weeks is slash interest rates because they've got no choice. They're going to slash interest rates. And everybody's very cr critical of Jean-Claude Trichet when he put up interest rates. I think in the back of his mind, he knew that the politicians would not make any hard decisions. So he used inflation as an excuse to put up interest rates so he could drop them later if needs be as a sort of you know, putting some foam down on the runway. But coming back to that, low interest rates don't create the right incentive structure to reduce debt. And that's the critical problem. But this is the Japan problem. You put the interest rates down, allowing the government to run up more debt, everybody to run up more debt, then of course you can't increase interest rates because if you increase interest rates, you become insolvent even quicker. Let me, let me just start, let me, let me jump in there for a second because you say higher, without higher interest rates, you don't have the right incentives to reduce the debt, i.e. to stimulate enough growth to pay off the debt. That seems to be counterintuitive to most people out there. They would think that lower interest rates somehow are a greater incentive, but that's not true, is it, Dust? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. And you create all these sort of terrible, terrible incentive problems in the economy. I'll tell you what they are. The first thing is, what's the incentive for the mass of the population who have been good and saved? What's the incentive for them to save if you're just basically going to rob them? Because essentially in Europe and in the United States, these people are earning negative real returns. What's the point of saving? So basically, they should just go and spend their money and throw themselves to the mercy of the government, which just basically accelerates the bankruptcy process. The other thing is, if you have really low interest rates, you have low cost of capital, which means the substitution between capital and labor and the right mix of the two changes in a very adverse way. And the two other real issues about that, which really, I think, are misunderstood, is the massive subsidy to the banking system. Because if you look at the banking system, the deposits are not costing them anything. So all they're now incentivized to do is to go and buy government bonds, which give a little bit more, which are risk-free assets, and take the carry between the rate on the government bond and the zero cost of their deposits. And this is what the American banks have been living off for the last two or three years. And so all the wrong incentive structures are put in place. And that's what we're going to see, which is why I am appalled 
at this whole idea that people like Sarkozy is pushing, oh, but if the ECB printed money, life would actually get better. I don't think it will. And the devaluation pressures that we actually put on the euro would be offset by the appreciation of the United States dollar, and they would basically start to print money to devalue. So it becomes a race to nowhere. And I think that's the big problem in all of this. All right, exactly. Das, we're out of time. Thanks again for being on the Kaiser Report. Max, it's my pleasure. All right, and that's going to do it for this edition of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. I'd like to thank my guest, DAS, D-A-S. Just Google it. Take you right there. If you'd like to send me an email, please do so at rttv.ru. You can follow us on Twitter or Facebook by just going to Kaiser Report. Until next time, Max Kaiser saying bye, y'all.